Um, I don't know if you're like me, but, you know, each year you may make a resolution or two. And um, a resolution that I tend to make every year is I want to get healthier. I want to lose weight and exercise. And sometimes I even stick to it. A good way that I have found to keep on track is to not only make a goal, but to track the progress towards that goal. Um, there's something about visualizing progress that helps me to stay motivated and to stay on track and to want to kind of continue to push those numbers. I think that's why devices like the Fitbit and, you know, other wearable technology has been so popular is because um, it becomes, it's kind of like gamifying the system, right? Um, figuring out what it is that you can do to, to motivate you to, to continue to get better. So in this tutorial, I want to walk through creating a modern Node.js application to keep track of weight measurements. We'll use some technologies like Postgres and a brand new Postgres client for Node.js. Um, we'll use Vue.js Vue on the front end, and we'll use, of course, Okta to secure the API and add account registration and login and all those kinds of things that uh, are no trivial uh, thing to do for any application, but Okta helps to make that so much easier. And um, before we begin, if you are following along, there are some prerequisites for uh, doing this tutorial. That those include uh, having Node.js, of course. Um, you're going to want <clears throat> uh, to have Node.js 12 or higher. Uh, I, at least that's what I would recommend. You could probably get away with Node.js 10, um, but you know, the the more recent, the better. Node.js 14 is out. It is, um, it's not yet part of what they call long-term support, but um, 12 is, is like, you know, the, the, the stable version of Node that's uh, uh, useful for, for anybody in, in any situation. If you're on Linux or Mac and you don't already have NVM, that's Node Version Manager, NVM, um, Man, that's a, a fantastic tool uh, to get a hold of, to use, to install new versions of Node. You could have multiple versions of Node installed uh, at the same time and be able to switch between those. So if you want to preview uh, version 14 and play around with it, you know that's the kind of thing I do is I'll install uh, using NVM whatever the next release of Node is coming out, but I'll keep a stable version for, for building like actual applications and, and things that I'm going to put into production or as uh, tutorials or whatever. I'm going to switch my view over to uh, the, my coding screen and you can see I've got, uh, this is the, the, the tutorial that I'm planning to walk us through. It's build a weight tracker app with Node.js and Postgres. If you want to, you can go to developer.octa.com um, and um, click on the blog link up at the top, and you will find this article uh, in the list of posts that are out that's out there. If you want to follow along with me using this article, that's that'd be great too. Uh, or you can, you know, I'm just going to walk through. Um, work. I wrote this several. Gosh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I guess it was a, a few months ago. Um, so I've slept since then. And so I'm looking at this brand new as if I had never done this before. <laughs> so this is all new to me too. Uh, I haven't looked at this tutorial in weeks so or, or, or months. And uh, so I, I don't even remember 
what all is in store for us as we go through this together. So again, it's a it's going to be a, a nice learning opportunity for all of us, or at least an opportunity for you to, you know, watch me uh, bumble around. So in uh, there's a an animated GIF that at the beginning of this tutorial that shows what we plan to build. We're going to add a, a login screen, uh, account registration screen. After you log in, you'll be able to uh, add measurements. Well, that tells you right there how long it's been since I've worked on this tutorial. That was back in January when I created this, uh, this animation. So uh, it uses a cool graph uh, chart to visualize the progress that uh, hopefully you're making. I can't uh, honestly say that I've made a whole lot of progress this year. There's just been, yeah, there's been a whole lot of life happen in the last six months, wouldn't you, or last five months, wouldn't you say, with uh, the virus and, and everything else. So I can't say that I've really stuck to um, my resolution goals as, as well as I, I wish I could have. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, you're going to need uh, Node.js version 12 or higher. You're going to want a, a Postgres database. And if you don't already have access to Postgres or have it installed, that's okay. We're, you can use Docker for that. And Docker is a fantastic uh, tool if you don't already have it to be able to install um, services like Postgres or MySQL or even SQL Server, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, which is my my usual go-to relational database. Um, so there's a SQL Server for Linux that you can install in Docker. And of course, you know, in, the, in this case, we're going to use Postgres. You're also going to need a free Okta developer account. This is this is free, free forever, free as in whatever you know, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, and uh, just, you know, just so that you know, it's free as in it's, you can use it for up to a thousand uh, active monthly users, which is fantastic if you're building an application and uh, if it's just for some colleagues, some, you know, if maybe it's a small scale application, it's just going to be, you know, in the dozens of people that are going to be using it, if you want to use it at work or use it, you know, among friends and, and family, absolutely use something like Okta to, to, to start out with. And if then, you know, my goodness, if, if it does take off and you have thousands of, of active users and you're able to monetize that, then by all means, you know, continue to, to use Okta and, uh, you know, ramp up the, you know, to one of the paid tiers. Um, but uh, for this tutorial, all you need is the, the free version and uh, won't have any issues at all with, uh, with doing that. So let's, as the tutorial says, let's dive in and create this Node.js project. So you're going to want to open up your terminal or command prompt and change to wherever it is that you store your projects. And let me open up mine. So I'm in my projects folder. I'm going to change uh, to my demos folder. And as the tutorial suggests, I'm going to make a uh, node weight tracker folder, change to that folder. And let's see, we need to, you know, first thing we need to do with any Node.js project is to initialize that project and we, we use npm init dash y for that. Well, dash y says take all the defaults for uh, building a an initialization file and just create a create a file with that. Uh, this creates a package.json file. Uh, if you don't specify the dash y parameter, then it's going to prompt you for like name and version and you know what kind of license to use and so forth. There's ways of setting these defaults um, ahead of time so that e each time you create a new project, it's consistent with um, the, the values that are put in there. Um, 
Now, if you got an error message when you typed in this command, then that means that either you don't have Node.js installed or you don't have uh, Node.js in the path uh, for your uh, system commands. So like on Windows, it'd be the, somewhere in your, your, your path statement. Um, well, I mean, it's the same on, on every operating system, I guess. You know, there's, there's an equivalent to that. Um, so now might be a time if, if you got an error message to go and install version uh, 12 and make sure that when you install it, if you're like if you're on Windows, there's a checkbox for, you know, to add Node.js to your, your path. So either you don't have it installed or it's not in your path, or maybe if you just now installed it and it's still not working, you may have to restart your terminal or, uh, you know, hopefully you don't have to restart your computer. I, I sure hope we're beyond the days of, of having to do that all the time. Um, so I've got the, the directory created here and um, just so that you can do things like npm-d to see what version of npm you have installed. I have 6.14.5 and node-v gives you the, the version of node that you have installed. I have 12.16.3, which I don't, I don't think is the absolute latest. As I mentioned before, if you use mvm, you can do one of the commands is mvm uh, ls remote version 12, and you can get a list of all the versions of Node that are uh, version 12, which is cool. So in the future, I will uh, re I'll install 12.17. All right, so we're in our, our folder. Right now, all we have is a package JSON, and we want to install m some more dependencies, things that we're going to need for our project. So this is not in the tutorial that's on the blog, but one of the first things I do, this is just a personal preference. Um, one of the first things I do with every Node.js project is I want to install um, ESLint, and I want to save this as a developer dependency. So I, I use the dash dash save dash dev. So I'll install ESLint and ESLint config reverent geek, which are, which is just my personal um, uh, set of root ESLint rules um, that I, I prefer. So ESLint is a linter, a linter for JavaScript that's going to catch common mistakes um, such as maybe you declared a variable but you never used it or you you're using a variable that you didn't declare ahead of time it, it adds some some syntax checking um, and then just um, expression rules and and all kinds of things it's going to help you to create consistently better code better JavaScript and we all know that we can we need all the help we can get with JavaScript right let me make sure I have my my chat open if you do have any questions along the way um, about what I'm doing or about any of the specific commands or the modules that I'm, I'm choosing to install, please let me know. Um, type those in the chat and, uh, or give me, uh, give me feedback. Yell at me on Twitter, whatever it takes, right? Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, I think I checked the, the audio levels and um, as far as I can tell, the, the screen is, set up correctly. I'm new to streaming and I'm I'm learning as uh, kind of by the, the seat of my pants, so to speak. All right, so now we need to install a bunch of other dependencies for this pro project. I'm uh, using Happy, which is a web framework for Node.js that I personally really like. It's one of my favorite. Um, 
arguably express is more is the is the most recognized uh, framework for building web applications with uh, Node.js. But there are there's some things about Happy that I really like. You know, it's got it's a little bit more opinionated than Express. I think it has a better module system, um, a more deterministic module system, so that you don't uh, run into issues where uh, modules are conflicting with each other or doing doing bad things with each other. Um, Happy's going to throw an error if you try to register the same route more than once, whereas Express uh, will allow you to re-register the same routes multiple times, and if it you know, that can be a really hard uh, issue to debug and figure out, well, why is this route not working like it's supposed to? And that's because, you know, some other module that you pulled in may be overriding that, that route that you, you've declared or from somewhere else. There's lots of other opinions. I just, you know, I really like it. And um, we're going to install Happy... 19 happy bell uh let me switch over to my my browser screen here and i want to show you some of the modules that that we're about to install so happy is the web application framework bell is a plug-in for uh, adding third-party logins boom is a plug-in for http errors this is another reason why i like happy I love the the names of the uh, the modules. I, I like to have fun. I you know, <laughs> I I hope you like to have fun too. And so, why not have some fun with the names? Cookie for cookie based authentication. Inert for serving static files. Joy, happy happy joy joy. Um, for is a plugin for validating requests and responses. Vision is for HTML templates. We're going to use the .env for managing environment variables in a environment file. EJS is a template engine based on JavaScript. It's um, embedded JavaScript, I believe is what EJS stands for. And then Postgres, a, a fairly new Postgres client that has come on the scene recently that... Uh, I, it's pretty exciting, I think, with uh, some of the features it has. And then another uh, one of my favorite modules for any Node.js project, at least any web application project, is NodeMon. It uh, automatically monitors your project folder for any file changes and automatically restarts your Node application. Um, the 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 with making sure that you don't use NodeMon in production. This is only a developer tool. Um, there are other process management tools that are uh, specifically built for uh, production, uh, for like hosting and, and managing a Node.js process. So we need to install all these dependencies and uh, install you know these relatively specific versions. So I'm going to copy and paste all of this stuff into the terminal window and just run those as they are. Just for compatibility, purposes I've versioned those um, normally when you install something you don't say you know you don't specify a version number like uh, at happy slash happy at 19 that's uh, the happy project and its other and its dependencies or its other modules are uh, uh, namespaced so that's the reason why, for having that that prefix of at happy slash and then the name of the module and then the last at say at happy at 19 that is specifying a uh, happy version 19 that's just because when i wrote this tutorial these were the versions the major versions of these modules that were available at that time there could be breaking changes for 
um, for some of these are, that may not be compatible with with all the code. So just to save ourselves some some frustration, um, we're going to stick with those versions. So now we have all those things installed. If I look at my folder, we now see that uh, we have a node modules folder and a package locked node modules is probably a bajillion um, files in there by now. Um, as 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 you may have seen the joke, you know the what's the heaviest thing in the universe? You know it's not a black hole. It's it's the node modules folder. Yeah, it's a struggle. All right, so now uh, I believe we can start maybe uh, setting up some more configuration and start with some code. So um, before we uh, get too far in the in the app, let's create a file name .env, which will be for our our configuration, like a port number, uh, our host name, and later on some some things like uh, our client ID and uh, client secret and things like that that we need for for login and security. So one way you can do that if you're on the Mac or Linux, you can use the the touch command touch.env and that that will create an empty file. Uh, I, I I really like that, but you don't. It, you can use uh, you can go ahead and open this folder in your favorite editor, and and start adding files and folders that way too. Um, I'm going to open this up in Visual Studio Code, and we'll see that we have a our node modules folder and our empty.env folder, and I'm going to add port equals 8080. And host equals local host. Oh, one thing I didn't do, uh, I, I went on this whole spiel about uh, why you should use ESLint and and installing those uh, dependencies. Uh, as you can see in the developer dependencies, we have have these things. Um, we need to set up a configuration file for ESLint too. So do that, I'm going to create a ESLint RC JS file. And I can never remember what's supposed to go into this file. So here's a here's a tip. From the command line, you can for any any module that you have installed, you can type npm docs and I'm going to say ESLint config Reverend Geek. And that's going to open up the documentation page for that module. Fantastic. I don't have to go searching for it or anything. It just, it just opens it up. So I know that I want this right here. This is the, the rule set for ESLint that is for Node.js and CommonJS modules. So I'm going to copy and paste this into my ESLint rc.js file. Boom. Now I have um, ESLinting. And one of the th first things it tells me is you don't have use strict. Right. So here's another tip that's a good idea for um, Node.js applications. Um, you may be used to in the browser or when you're using a tool like Babel uh, for transpiling um, or if you're a TypeScript person and you're used to writing TypeScript and transpiling that to JavaScript, all those tools will automatically add use strict at the top of every file. And if you happen to be fortunate enough to use the latest, latest ES uh, uh, modules such as the imports and exports statement with browsers, those types of uh, modules automatically have strict mode turned on uh, by default. 
But in the world of Node.js, at least for the time being, if unless you're using Node 14 and able to use imports and exports, um, every JavaScript file is not running in strict mode by default. Uh, so common, any of the common JS modules. Um, so that's one of the ESLint rules that I put in to with, to remind me when you're when I create a new JavaScript file, I need to add the use strict uh, keyword at at the top of every single file. Um, what does that do for you? Well, it's just another safeguard to keep you from making uh, some silly mistakes or from running into some older, unexpected JavaScript behavior. So that use strict mode kind of turns off some, some bad behavior that JavaScript has been known for in the past. Um, so cool. Always, always have strict mode turned on uh, for Node.js. It is not on by default unless you are using import and export. All right. Now, let's, um, still following along in our tutorial. So, in the tutorial I've got here, uh, talking about Visual Studio Code, if you don't already have a, your, uh, a, a favorite code editor, I highly recommend Visual Studio Code. I love it. Use it every day. Uh, can't believe just how awesome this thing has has become over the years, last few years. Um, it is one of the best, if not the best, JavaScript debuggers um, available, in my opinion. So we create our in, uh, env file. Next, we want to create a folder uh, named source, and then source creates some folders called uh, assets, plugins, routes, and templates. All right, so. From the command, I'm going to do this from the command line. You can do this from from within Visual Studio Code, but I uh, I just like I just like running commands. Mcdir source. Uh, let's see assets, plugins, routes, and So now, if you look at your project, you should see this structure. Um, this is how we're going to organize code. Now, there's there's as many opinions about how you should structure a Node.js project as there are um, JavaScript developers. Uh, everybody has an opinion about how to do it. This is this is the approach that I like when I'm building a happy. Uh, Java's uh, Node.js application is to have the source folder for the server side code and and just have it broken up into these folders. Now, I believe in showing real world, like not just a hello world, hey, I could put everything in one giant JavaScript file and show you that it works. I I want to show my goal and any time I create a tutorial is to is to show you what I think are like at least next level um, structure for building an application. So instead of having an assets folder, we could just have an assets.js file and throw everything into that one file. Uh, but I don't think that's um, that's doing you any favors if I, if I show you an approach to doing it like that. Uh, I like to go ahead and set up uh, some structure to my application because I know as the application grows, I'm going to need some organization. I'm going to need to um, have multiple modules in assets, multiple module, multiple plugins, multiple routes, and I want to organize those routes into separate files so that they're logically grouped, right? Um, so I don't think I'm doing anyone a service if I just sh show the quick and dirty hello world approach to building something. But 
that being said, let's create a Hello World web app with Happy. So in the source folder, let's create a new file, index.js. Nothing magical, but index.js is one of the recognized files where uh, if you tell Node, hey, uh, uh, give me a module and just specify the, the source folder name, it's going to look for files like index.js and load load that up automatically. So in um, the source folder, I'm just going to copy, um, hope you don't mind, I'm going to copy from the tutorial itself and paste that in here and we can walk through uh, what this code is doing. That, that saves me from you having to hear me type and retype and and you know just have a lot of flailing around. So we're going to again use the the use trick at the top uh, require in a couple of our modules the .env which is our environment which what reads in our .env file. Um, happy itself uh, we're going to load up our routes modules and we have a create server function that is an async function love being able to use async and await everywhere in node um, that's it's so fantastic so we're going to create our happy server using the happy server constructor and we're going to specify uh, the port and the host and we've also specified if for whatever reason the port and host are not defined in our environment variables that will uh, default those to 8080 and localhost. We're going to register the routes for the, the server and return that server from the function. And then we have an init function, which is also async and await. Um, we're going to first read in our environment initialize our, our environment, uh, create our server, which is calling the create server function, and we're going to await server.start. So wait for, for Happy to initialize all of its internals, and then we're going to run uh, log to the console, server running at whatever the, the URI is for that server. And then we have uh, an unhandled rejection error uh, error handler, so that it, if something does just uh, completely crash and we don't have an error handler defined elsewhere in the code, it's going to log this out and and kill the the application. And then um, finally call that init function to kick off the uh, the server. All right. Um, next, we're going to create that routes module. So under source routes, let's create a new file and name this index.js. And we're going to define our very first route handler. Again, using uStrict, uh, we're creating a, a object here called home. And in this object, it has the properties method, path, and then a handler function. The handler function takes in a request object and a what's called the happy response toolkit. Uh, it's typically re abbreviated as, as H. And, you know, in a as typical of a um, hello world application, we're just returning the phrase hello world is a string. And then we're exporting. This is where the magic happens when you're creating a module uh, for Node.js is we're using the module.exports and we're exporting an array of things. In this case, it's an array with only a single uh, object in it of, with home. So that when we uh, make this call in the uh, index to require in the, our routes module, uh, it automatically loads up 
the index.js file. We don't have to we don't have to specify slash index.js. That is the default type of thing uh, that happens for us with uh, with uh, Node.js. Caveat. Defaults work with common JS, which is what we've had up until Node.js 14. Node.js 14, if you're using import and export syntax, you don't have this, this nice shortcut. You have to specify the full path to any file, including the slash index.js and, you know, the JS extension. Bummer. I, I think I may stick with common JS. Just, just for that reason. I don't know. Maybe not. All right. So we're pulling in routes, and we've got our routes, to, our routes defined, which is just the one route. And now we want to launch our Node.js application. And the way we want to do that is I'm going to, we're going to go into package.json and add a script that we can call anytime we want to to launch our application and use NodeMon to monitor for changes and restart it. So we're going to create a, overwrite this test script with a dev script, and we're going to use NodeMon, set a watch parameter of our source folder, and we're going to tell NodeMon to uh, specifically monitor file changes to files that have the extension EJS and JS. And our start is source uh, index.js. Okay. And now we can say npm run dev. And it's going to run that nodemon script. Uh, nodemon is printing to the console. Um, that it's starting up and uh, gives you a, a hint there that if anytime you want to re manually restart the server, you can type in RS and enter and it will restart the server. But it's going to be monitoring any change to any JavaScript or EJS file and restart that for us. So um, nice little shortcut on this particular terminal I have is I can hold down the, the command button and click on the URL and it's going to open this up in my default browser. Um, you can, you know, use your own. Uh, you can copy and paste that, or just type it into your browser. But localhost eighty eighty and there's hello world. And just to demonstrate that uh, NodeMon is doing what we expect, I'm going to uh, switch over to here and go to routes. Instead of hello world, I'm going to change this to hello stream viewers. Save that. And if we look at um, the command line, we see that uh, restarting due to changes. And without having to restart Node.js, I can come over here and refresh the browser, and we have hello stream viewers. Success. We're we're on our way to building a sweet, super cool, and awesome Node.js application. All right. Now, now we get to the fun stuff. Let me take a, a sip of a hot beverage. We need Postgres. Uh, part of this application is we're going to be using a, a database, and uh, Postgres is the example in this tutorial. Um, if you already have po Postgres installed and you're comfortable with using it and you've got your login credentials and all that stuff, and maybe you know how to create your own uh, database and um, run scripts, cool, awesome. Um, I'm going to walk through using uh, Docker for setting up Postgres. Now, if you don't already have Docker installed, 
that's something you're going to need to do. So let's let's just take a look. Docker. Uh, maybe we'll go to Docker documentation. There's a getting started. There's a download and install. Um, so looks like Docker Desktop for Mac is what comes up for me because I'm running on a Mac. Whatever shows up for you under uh, Get Docker. Uh, if you don't, like I said, if you don't already have it installed, maybe you go and and do that now. It's it may take a while. Um, you know, hopefully, if you were with me from the beginning and you didn't already have Docker installed, maybe you went and installed it while I was blabbing on about ES Lint or something. Um, but assuming that you have Docker installed, I'm going to press Control C to stop NodeMon. I'm going to make sure that I have Docker installed. I'm going to type Docker PS. And hey, it doesn't give me an error. So sweet, I have Docker installed and I have Docker running. I don't have any containers right now. That's that's fine. Uh, that's what we're about to do next. So I'm going to switch back to my my code here or my um, preview my my own tutorial so that I've got the right commands. And we're going to call Docker pull Postgres latest. And it's going to go through and, and pull down the, the latest image for the uh, Postgres database. If you may already have the latest version of Postgres downloaded to your system, then it will just quickly uh, go to the end. Like if I were to run this again, it should just go, boink, you have it. Sweet. Um, so now I have the image installed or downloaded. Now I need to create a container that's running an instance of this image so that I have a local Postgres database server running in Docker. And I'm going to copy and paste in a command to do that. And then I'll walk you through what this command is doing. So docker run so it's I'm, I'm running an image and i'm specifying uh dash d which is launch it launches that uh container in what's called uh, daemon mode um like uh daemon processes that's kind of a, a linux or unix term uh, so that tells it to run in the background i don't have to uh, manually have Docker this Docker command running. It's going to launch an instance of it, and and it's going to just live until either I shut it down or uh, I restart my computer. Um, it's just going to continue to run. So Docker run dash d. I'm going to name it, uh, give it a specific name of measurements. So that makes that just makes it easier for me to issue Docker commands. So that I don't have to use some big long string of of whatever Docker uh, automatically assigns to it. Uh, mapping some ports. So dash p. I'm mapping my local 5432 to the containers port 5432. That's going to allow us to transparently uh, you know, forward uh, client requests to the Docker container. So from the code's perspective, it's no different than if Postgres was installed on my machine and running as a service on my machine, as opposed to inside a container. And then we're specifying a, an environment variable with the dash E parameter, and we're setting the Postgres admin password to some secure password. You can you can change this to whatever you like. Um, this is all running locally, so not a huge deal, but certainly if you're going to install 
Postgres in production, you're going to want to set a more secure password for the admin account. And then finally, I'm specifying the Postgres image. So if you're running a um, running a an image as a container, uh, the final parameter is going to be the name of the image that you want to launch. So, boom, I got some big GUID here. Let's let's um, use Docker PS again. Hey, PS is you know shows the processes that uh, are running in Docker. And I have an image called Postgres. I have, um, it's the name is measurements and it was created 12 seconds ago. It finished booting up 10 seconds ago. If I run it again, yeah, 36, you know, so it took about a second or less than two seconds for this um, container to, to fire up. And now I have, Postgres running. Um, I think I mentioned this before. Postgres, will, the, the database will continue to run uh, indefinitely until either you stop it with the stop command, like I can say uh, docker stop measurements, something like that. Um, but if you restart your computer, just know that your containers are not automatically going to restart. So uh, if you restart your computer and you come back and you want to play around on this project some more, then you all, then you need to use Docker start um, in the name of the uh, container. Cool. Now let's add some configuration to our environment file. And I'm just going to copy and paste in some stuff here. So open up .env and... Somewhere below what we already have, I'm going to paste in our Postgres configuration. So we're setting PG host equal to local host, username to Postgres, database is also named Postgres by default. The password is the password we specified in the as an environment variable command line parameter, and our command line argument, and then our port is 5432. If you change your password or you're using a different instance of um, Postgres that you have in your development environment one way or another, either it's hosted on your machine or it's hosted somewhere else on your network, then of course you're going to want to change all of these values to match your instance of Postgres, the host, the username, the database, the password, the port if necessary, all that. Now, to use a new database, um, we need a way to create tables to probably add some initial data and so forth. One way to do that is to create a script. And here we're going to use Node.js to execute a build script that will create that schema and uh, data that we need uh, to, you know, to initialize our database. And usually this is only done one time or each time that maybe your schema changes, uh, depending on how you want to create your, your initialization, initialization scripts. Um, you may, you know, for, for a real world production database, you're probably want to start creating uh, incremental change scripts that uh, only run if the database is not in uh, the same version as uh, what you're building in, in development. So we're going to create a new folder in uh, the root of our project called Tools. And under Tools, I'm going to create a new file called initdb.js. And I'm going to paste in a bunch of code, and then we'll walk through what this code does. So, initdb, this is this is something that we're going to run outside of the web application. This is we're only going to run this one time, 
and that's to initialize our database. Um, we can run it as many times as we want to. Um, you know, anytime we want to kind of reset our database, we could do that with this script. So we're reading in our, our environment variables that are that's in our environment config file. Uh, we're requiring in the Postgres client, and we've got an init um, function that's going to uh, read in those those environment variables, and then we've got a try catch block to wrap around this in case there's any errors. Um, create an instance of the Postgres client, which by default um, recognizes these environment, these very specific environment variables. So the client knows to look for PG host, PG username, and so forth, so that we, we don't have to specify that when we create the client. Um, then we're going to log to the console, dropping the table if it exists. We're going to drop, use that command, drop table if exists, measurements, and await that. So this, this client that we're using, the, the Postgres client, is pretty cool. Um, it's using uh, template uh, strings. Um, gosh, there's a, there's a word for this um, that I'm, that's escaping me right now. Um, these are uh, It's like an attribute type string where this is a, a command. Uh, I don't know. Maybe someone in the in the chat can can help me out <laughs> um, if if you happen to know what the name of this is called. But uh, this is a it's executing this function with this template literal string. Um, so we're going to await SQL. And this is the command that we're passing to the client as a as a string. We're going to create that new table uh, that it, if not exists, it's a table named measurements. It has an ID that is not null. It's a primary key. It's automatically generated. Uh, it's an identity column. So all those are Postgres uh, keywords that that t say this is an auto-generated ID. Um, there are equi there's equivalent syntax for doing this in MySQL and SQL Server. Um, you know, you can find those those differences. We're going to create a user ID column that is a var car fifty. It's not null, so we're not going to allow any nulls in there. Uh, a measure date uh, with a date data type, a weight which is a numeric field with, um, basically this is up to a five comma one means it can be a number as high as 9999.9. And we're specifying a precision of one tenth of, of a decimal. That's what the, you know, five, we're, we're storing five numbers and the precision is a, a single decimal point. Does that make sense? Same kind of syntax is uh, equivalent in other data relational databases. And then we're going to, after we create our table, we're going to close our database connection. Uh, and uh, if there are any errors, we're going to log those to the console. Um, and then finally, we call that init function um, in case you didn't know, uh, async and await in JavaScript is really just syntax, syntactic sugar around promises. So we can call um, awaitable functions or async functions as if they were a promise. So we're doing init and then calling dot bin as if it were at, because it is a promise. And um, after all, everything's done, we're logging to the console that it's finished. Or if there's an error, We'll, we'll log finished with errors. So now let's go back to the package JSON file and let's add another 
uh, script, we'll, we'll call this one init bb, and the command that we want to run is, is node, and pass it the name of the, uh, the file that we've created. And let's go to the command line, run npm, run init db, fingers crossed, or whatever it is that you want to call it. Uh, success, I think. So cool. We got an error message, but that error message it was not fatal. It was just a warning saying that measurements does not exist. So it's skipping the, uh, the drop statement. So it created the table and we're done. If we were to run it again, we're probably, we don't see that same warning message because measurements does exist. And so it drops the table if it exists, creates the table, and now we're done. We now have a measurements table in our database. Sweet. Now, next step, another big leap in our Node.js application is to uh, add authentication to Node and to Happy. So when building any application like this weight tracker, you're probably going to want to keep your data safe and secure and private. And it would be nice to share this application with other people so that they can use it too. Um, however, to build user registration, logins, uh, authentication, password resets, uh, email rem, um, verification, all the all that kind of stuff, man, that's that's no trivial task. Um, and to and to get any of that wrong could expose your data to to hackers. Uh, could uh, expose you know, your passwords if you're not properly uh, hashing your your passwords. You know, there's just a lot of things that can go wrong, and it's it's a scary space to be in if you're trying to add security to an application. So, how about we keep all this concern and 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 use a security expert to do that stuff for us. And that's, that's what uh, a company like Okta does. That's, that's what they do best, right? Do, do one thing and do it extremely well, and that's, that's what Okta is known for. So Okta makes this pretty easy to do for any application in any platform. So to begin, you're going to want to go to... Um, developer.octa.com and click on the big sign up button or create a free account button. And if you don't already have an Octa account, uh, if you do already have an Octa account, click on the login and, and uh, go to your dashboard. After you go through the sign up process and you um, get your, your free account, uh, you have to verify it through an email and, and that kind of thing. You don't have to have a credit card or any of that kind of stuff. Um, after you sign up and you log in, and I'll uh, log in myself as well, then you're going to come to your Okta developer dashboard. And wrong screen. Let's see. First thing you're going to do is after you have your an account, you're going to want to create an application. So click on the applications you know, on your dashboard, click on add application. And the type of application that we're creating for this tutorial is a web application. It's a server side uh, application. So that, that falls under the category of platforms like .NET and Java and of course Node.js 
and, and lots of others. So click on web, click on next, and now we have our application settings. Most of these things we can leave as default. Let's call it um, my weight tracker. And instead of on the logout, um, instead of just the bare URL, let's, let's specify slash logout. We'll create a route for this logout um, just in case somebody wants to, to log out of their, their uh, an account. We have an opportunity to uh, clear that session cookie and, and so forth. So everything else can be left as default. Uh, get down to the bottom and click done. Boom, you have your application. And there's a couple of things down here that we're going to need. And that those things are your client ID and your client secret. So I'm going to copy and paste some code some configuration from uh, the tutorial over into our the environment file. So um, let me move this up to the top. And I'll explain what these things are. So um, not only do we want to have a a host, but also a host URL. This will come in handy for when we're building. URLs and specifying redirects and so forth. Um, we need a cookie encrypt password. This is something that's machine specific. Um, it needs to be some kind of long string of gibberish, at least 32 characters long. Um, this is something you, you definitely want to keep secure in your environment. Uh, I just have something silly here called super awesome password string, but it's at least 32 characters long. Exclamation. Super secure. And then uh, specifying the node environment as development. And you can set this to production when you are deploying to production. That's going to, that's something you absolutely want to do when you're deploying to production is to make sure that node environment is set to production. Um, and then we also added these three environment variables our Okta org URL. The Okta client ID and the Okta client secret. Um, that client ID and client secret are part of the, the application that we just created in uh, in our Okta dashboard. So I'm going to click on this button to copy the client ID. I'm going to paste that in and do the same with the client secret. Normally, you would never share this client secret with anyone. This is something that you want to keep secure um, because this is what um, your application is, is using to communicate with the Okta application to ensure that you are who your application is, who it says it is. Um, this, um, I'm, I'm not too worried about you seeing this in this tutorial because I'm planning to delete this after um, this application after the tutorial is over. So not that big a deal. The other third thing, the third thing you need is your Okta org URL. And where you find that is back on your dashboard. So if you, if you go to your Okta um, login, and click on dashboard, your org URL is this right here. It, you know, it's probably go, probably going to be different than what I have. It may, it may not even be Okta Preview. It may be something else for you. Um, but mine is this value, and I'm going to copy and paste that into um, my environment. Okay, got the environment set up, and now another thing that you'll you'll want to do as part of your Okta application is, you know, wouldn't it be nice if people who you could just give 
someone the URL to your web app, and they can go in and register themselves and create a new account and use it, you know, without you having to create an account for them, right? That is something that has to be turned on um, in your Okta application. It's not on by default. So that's called self-service registration. And you'll find this under Users and Registration. So click on that. And right now, mine is turned on. But um, by default, it's not. So to, wait, to turn it on, you click the Edit button, uh, choose Enabled, and then just scroll down to the bottom and uh, click Save. While we're on the screen, you know, it, it's interesting, maybe interesting to you to know that you can add other fields to your registration form. So if you want to um, include or require other values as part of your registration, you can do that. All right, so we got that enabled. And now we need to update our code, our, our web application to start um, using uh, Okta for doing logins and registrations and all that kind of stuff. So let's switch over to our Node app. And under Source, we're going to create a new plugin. So under the Plugins folder, create a file named auth.js. And again, in the, for the sake of time and all the typing and stuff that would re be required. I'm going to copy and paste in some code here and walk you through it. So in this auth.js plugin, we're, we're requiring in Bell, which is, as I mentioned before is for third-party logins, uh, Cookie, which is for uh, cookie-based sessions. That's typical of any web application, regardless of platform, is to use cookie sessions to um, store, you know, the current session information. And then um, we're specifying, is is this secure? In other words, are we, um, based on our node environment variable, it is, uh, is it, if it's equal to production, then this is a, a we're going to assume that our site is secure, being secured with uh, SSL, HTTPS, but if we're running locally on local host, then it's then we're not we're just using plain HTTP. Um, to define a happy module, uh, you export a object, and that object has some specific parameters. So very similar to when we created uh, our routes, uh, a new plugin has a name property, it has a version property. And it has a register function. Every every mod plugin module for Happy needs to follow this kind of uh, uh, pattern. So our name, the name of our module is auth version 1.0, and we have our register function that takes in uh, the Happy uh, the current instance of the of the Happy server. So using the Happy server, we're going to register our other um, dependencies, which are the, the cookie and bell, so we can pass that register as a, an array of those modules or plugins. And then we're going to configure our authentication strategy for uh, Happy. So this is a, a session, a cookie session strategy. The cookie, we're naming the cookie Okta OAuth. We have to specify a path, uh, set that to the, the, the root. The, this, is, this is really important because um, if the path is, is kind of dependent on, if, if you don't specify the path, then I think it's dependent on the route that you're currently on and um, yeah, it can have some unexpected errors where it looks like you've logged in, but somehow you're not logged in or somehow it's not recognizing that you're logged in. That can be a really frustrating uh, thing to, to happen. And I, it's happened to me enough times that it's like, 
I've got to remember to specify the path. Um, so we specify the password that we're going to use to encrypt the, the session information. And that's the, the super cool and awesome cookie password that we specified in the environment file. You know, the super long and awesome 32 character password. And then whether or not this is a uh, secure, uh, this should, a should ab absolutely be true if you're running this application in production. And then finally, uh, where to redirect to if the person is not um, logged in or uh, the session is being uh, initialized. And that is our authorization code callback route, um, which uh, we will define in a little bit. And then finally, we need to specify our, our authentication strategy of with Bell, and that is, um, you know, f for any, any other part of our application, it's going to check the session cookie. And if the session is valid, then it knows that, that we're logged in. But for the login itself, then we, we want to use Okta for that. So we're registering um, a, an authentication strategy with using Bell. The name of the strategy is Okta. The provider is Okta. So Bell already understands this. Bell has a number of third-party um, strategies that it um, is equipped with that you can choose from, and Okta is one of them. And then we're going to use a config uh, specify that our um, our U, the URI for our, our org URL, uh, the same password that we're using for our cookie sessions, whether or not it's secure, the location of our um, our site, which is the host URL, uh, the client ID and the client secret. So the host URL has to match. When you're, when you're redirecting to Okta to log in and it's going to redirect back, all those things have to match up or um, it's going to throw an, an error somewhere along the way. Either the application is going to throw an error or the Okta login process is going to give you a, a, an error message. We're, we're setting the default authentication strategy to the cookie session, that means for any route that uh, requires authentication, it's going to default to session. And then we're going to explicitly specify on the login route to use the Okta uh, Bell strategy. And then here's a, a really nice thing we can do with Happy. This is, this is like, you know, an added bonus to this tutorial. Uh, we're going to add an extension to the server that on, using the on pre-response event, we're going to check, is this uh, response a view, which is like we're, we're going, it's not an API route, it's a view where we're going to render HTML and send it down to the browser. Um, we're going to check, is this is the person uh, that's requesting this view, are they authenticated? If they are, then we're going to set uh, some values, uh, we're, or we're going to create a, an auth object that has these properties. Authenticated true, anonymous is false, the email address, the first name, last name, and then we're going to set uh, on the context of this request to this auth object. There, there's a lot here to, to digest, but hopefully, if I can explain this, is that on every request, we're going to add to that request an auth object that is going to expose whether or not the person is authenticated or anonymous, and some basic profile information like email, first name, and last name. 
And what that allows us to do is that anywhere uh, in our uh, view templates, we can access that data um, when we're when we're processing our our view templates. Um, and we can we can throw, you know, but creating an extension like this, we can throw whatever data we want to have. We want to surface on every request. Okay. So now <clears throat> let's add a a new file to our plugins folder. Uh, let's call it index.js. And in here, we're going to specify or put in this code. And we're going to pull in the inert and vision plugins from the happy framework, uh, the EJS uh, JavaScript templates, our auth authentication, our auth plugin that we just created. And then in um, this module, we're exporting a an object that has a register function that takes in a server. We're going to register those plugins, the inert, vision, and auth. And then we're going to configure the happy server to use EJS as the view template engine. So uh, engines, uh, we're specifying EJS. We're saying relative to the, the current directory of the application, the path is templates. So we're going to uh, create, um, it's going to be in this templates folder. And then the layout, we're going to specify a layout true. We're going to create a, a layout template that, that creates like the, the HTML head and um, the, you know, body tags and all that kind of stuff so that we have just one place of creating the default layout for our web application. And then each view can just worry about specifying what gets injected in the body of that page. All right, let's add some HTML templates. So under the templates folder, let's create a new file called layout.ejs. And uh, grab some source code here. This template, um, so we've got our head tag with some meta tags. Uh, title of the HTML of this page is going to be equal to title. We're, we're injecting that into this template based on the view that's being rendered. So the, uh, from a model view controller idea, if you're familiar with that metaphor, uh, a view is combined with data and rendered together to generate HTML. So when we go to render this layout, this layout expects that one of the pieces of data that is passed is it contains a, a title. Hey, thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for joining, Frackberg. Have a good rest of your day, and hope you do. Uh, uh, check back with the uh, the finished video. Um, so we we have some links to some style sheets. Where uh, in this example, I'm using a tutorial. We're using Bulma as a CSS framework. We've also got our own custom uh, styles uh, in a site.css file that we'll create uh, later on. Uh, we're pulling in view. Uh, version 2.6.11. We're also pulling in um, Font Awesome to give us like some icons and things like that. And then we've got our own site JS file that we'll create. Um, EJS has, you know, some of this syntax should look a little bit familiar if you've used temp templates and other applications. The the concepts are very similar from one to another, just the syntax may, be, may look different. So angle percents um, are what is used to 
do things like inject values or inject includes or run commands or functions. So we're we're including in a navigation template which we'll we'll create and then we're injecting the content and that'll be the the actual view that we are sending down. Now let's create that navigation um, template. So let's create a new file under source templates navigation.ejs and we'll paste in some more code. This is a nav bar and uh, a lot of this I lifted from the Bulma documentation. Um, the name of the application, uh, the logo for the application is just weight tracker. Um, and then we've got a, a burger, uh, a menu burger, so that if, if the uh, width of the window is smaller than a certain amount, um, it's going to assume that maybe it's running on mobile. It, this, this is kind of like a responsive design using Bulma. Um, and then we've got some um, navigation stuff here. We've got a, a home that just takes us to home, a progress button that takes us to the slash list route, an add measurement button or link that takes us to slash add. And then we have, like on the right-hand side of the navigation bar, we have some profile information that if the current viewer is authenticated, then we want to give them a message. Welcome auth.firstname. Uh, if they're not authenticated, then we want to show the login uh, buttons. Uh, or no, if uh, now we show some login or logout buttons, depending on if the current person is authenticated. So if they're authenticated, if they're not authenticated, show the login button or login link. If they are authenticated, show the logout link. And now let's add a template for our home page. So under templates, let's create a file uh, index. EJS. And we've got a title, Node.js Weight Tracker. And again, we're, we're using some of that, that contextual information that's exposed through that um, server extension we added on the uh, authentication plugin, which uh, checks to see if, the, if it's anonymous. And it's doing the same kind of thing like the navigation does. Anonymous, show a login button. If it's authenticated, show a uh, weight measurement and, you know, other options to view progress. And then while we're at it, let's create a template for our 404 page. So if somebody tries to go to a, a, uh, a link that doesn't exist, let's just throw up a a sad response. Oh no, that page was not found. You can be as creative as you want with that. Now, comes some fun parts. We're going to create some routes uh, for our application, like the login and logout routes and callback routes and lists and all that great stuff. Um, and there's ways that we can uh, use our authentication to uh, make sure that whoever's accessing that route is authenticated. If not, we want to redirect them to log in. So under routes, let's um, let's close some of these other pages. So under our routes folder, create a new file, and uh, let's you know, for lack of better words, let's just call it the auth 
our set of off routes. And I'm going to copy in some more code. We're pulling in the boom module, which is a, an error handling module for plugin for happy. We have a login route, which is a uh, just a get method with a, a path of slash login. And we're checking there's not not really anything we have to do here. It's just uh, by default, our session strategy, our authentication strategy is our session cookie. And if it's not authenticated, then it's going to redirect. Um, so login is going to redirect. And, we, and just for, as a backup, we don't have to have this in here, but if it's not authenticated, then we return an error message. We have our OAuth callback route, which as you know, specified in the Okta configuration by default is slash authorization dash code slash callback. So we're, we're setting up a route to handle that information. And uh, when that comes back, we're going to set our, our cookie auth with the request dot auth dot credentials. That's the payload of that, that callback that uh, is coming back from um, the authentication. And then when we're done setting the cookie, then we just redirect the user uh, to the home page. And we're specifying in the options that the auth method that we're using for this route is the Okta uh, strategy that we define. We have a logout route that is also a get slash logout. And um, if they are authenticated, then call request.cookieauth.clear. We're going to clear that session cookie and then redirect them to the home page. And that's it. We uh, export those three uh, routes as an array. Next, let's create our, um, or let's open up the index.js file of our routes and let's register, let, let's replace the hello world thing that we have here right now with the, the routes that we, that we need for this application. So, uh, I'm gonna pull in path, which is a built-in Node.js module that, you know, gives us some utilities that we'll use. Uh, we'll pull in the auth routes that we just defined. So relative to this file, pull in auth.js. Let's define a home route that is the, the root of our site. Auth mode is try. So there are, let me, let me see if I can remember. There's, um, the try mode is is going to check to see if the user is authenticated, but it doesn't require authentication. It's not going to trigger uh, sending that that user to the login. It's just going to say, "Is there a is there a session?" And if so, um, go ahead and kind of initialize that authentication information. Uh, that's necessary because we want we want to know on any given route that uh, the, whether or not the user is logged in or not. So try, try is going to attempt but not force uh, uh, authentication. And then the handler is going to return h.view. So the response toolkit that's built into Happy has uh, this view function and passing into that function, the name of the view that we want to render, render, which is index, and the second argument is the data that we want to pass to that view. And the only data that we're passing for the home page is the title of that page. We need to define 
some route a route for our static assets and these are things like our CSS file our JavaScript file uh, any images or fonts or anything else that we want to package with our web application and we just want to serve those as files we're not we're not uh, executing those files we're just serving them so we're using uh, that, that path object to join together the current directory of this module along uh, speci specifying that everything that's in the asset folder. So whenever you get a route, a, a request for something that starts with slash assets slash and then some like file name, like uh, site dot uh, JPEG, uh, site.css, site.js. It's going to pass along, um, it's going to attempt to handle this request using files that are in the assets folder. And authentication is not required to access any of these files. Any of these files are available to the public. Uh, specify our 404 page. So anything that is not already um, caught or registered explicitly with the routes, then we want to return our 404 template with a title of not found and also send down a HTTP status of 404. And again, Authentication is not required to view the 404 page. And then finally, we're going to export an array of these modules or array of these um, routes along with the auth routes that we pulled in from the uh, auth module. So those, those are all our routes that we have for the application, I believe. Now let's add um, our static assets. So an assets folder, let's create a file called site.css and that's it. We're going to specify our navbar logo has a font weight of bold and a font size of 1.2 em. And now let's create a site.js folder or file. And in here, we're going to create, add some code. And this is uh, basically straight out of the Bulma documentation. This, this is not necessary um, other than if we want to have that responsive design where if the window gets too small, like on a somebody's looking at this on a phone or a tablet, then it's going to the navigation bar at the top of the page is going to change to that hamburger icon, and this code sets up handling uh, the showing and hiding of the menu. So um, it's going to. Select the nav bar burgers. And again, I lifted this code straight off the Bulma documentation. So if it doesn't work, then I don't know. Maybe, maybe blame them. But it's going to add a listener for a click event. And in that click event, it's going to toggle the showing and hiding of that menu. Sweet ass. All right. So now let's, um, I think we may be ready to test what we've done so far. Let's switch over to our command line and run npm run dev. Uh-oh. Route missing authentication strategy and no default defined. Well, it should have been defined. Maybe I skipped a step. Oh, uh, you know what? 
Let's see. This is where the live streaming code gets interesting, right? Debugging what should have happened. So let's see. Our server routes, we're pulling in routes. We are registering those routes. Our plugins, we, we have our auth plugin. Am I registering plugins? No, I am not. So I must have skipped a step somewhere in there. We need to register our plugins as part of the server registration. So I'm going to uh, require in that plugins folder, which by default is going to read in the index.js, that index.js pulls in uh, all the modules that, all the plugins that we have defined, including the uh, framework plugins. Uh, so we need to register our plugins, I think. Maybe we specified this a different way. Okay. So we did this a little bit different. So instead of calling server.register, we actually need to call this register function from th that we're exporting. So instead of this, we're going to say plugins.register, passing in the server, and let's await that. That should give us um, everything that we're looking for. Okay, so now the server is running without any startup errors. Uh, fingers crossed. Boom, we got a uh, we got an error message. Okay, so implementation error, but our layout part of the include. Did not find the include file includes navigation. So maybe I did I oh so um, I think the way I have it set up in the uh, registration or the, the, the way I have it set up in the layout is that it looks for the path, includes, and uh, navigation is in the includes folder. So let's try that. Let's move navigation into the in includes folder. Um, Nodemon saw that we made a change, automatically restarted. So now let's go back to the home page, restart, refresh. Yay! We have our weight tracker. And it has a login. Welcome to the Node.js Weight Tracker Sample Project. Click here to log in. Okay. Now, I could click on this login, and either you know, I would be prompted to log in to my Okta account, or I might get automatically redirected uh, back to the application with a, with a session. And that's because, you know, Okta also keeps track of if I'm logged in or not. So in order to make sure that this is working um, as we would expect, let's launch a private window. If I can remember the command to do so. And we're going to go to localhost 8080. Click the login. Boom, we got our login form. Log in with uh, your um, Okta developer credentials. And you'll notice that, you know, our registration, self-registration is enabled. So don't have an account, click sign up and that, that will 
go to the registration form. So we'll click sign in. We got redirected back to the home page. And we now have, we see our message, welcome David. There's a log out instead of a log in. Um, we got something wonky going on with the, uh, th the menu is not working quite right. But this is, this is looking good. So um, successful. So Lee MW 1977 says, don't have much time to spend with you folks today. We wanted to pop in to say hi and hope you're, hope you're well. Um, hope you're well, Lee. Uh, thanks for dropping in. Um, hope you're, I hope everyone uh, watching this is, is doing well. All right, we're, we're on the home stretch. We have our, our login is working. Our views are working. Um, maybe our CSS isn't working quite right with the navigation menu, but uh, that's something I'm sure we could, we could figure out if we really dove into it. If I resize this window, of course, it stretches out beyond what you can see, but you can see that the, you know, beyond a certain threshold, the navigation bar looks looks okay. It looks like it's supposed to. So I'm going to close this and also close this one. And let's see what what do we do next? I know we got at our database stuff and measurements. So let's create um, the next start. Part is to create a secure API uh, that we can that talks to our Postgres SQL database and we can do some interesting things around adding measurements uh, retrieving measurements showing that 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 pretty graph and and so forth um, authentication is working we can now focus on our API our first first thing we want to do is Create a plugin for our database, our SQL uh, client. So in the plugins folder, create a, um, a new file, SQL.js, and let's look at some code for that. So we're in this plugin, we're pulling in the Postgres um, client. We're exporting a <clears throat> our plugin object, which has the name and version properties like we've seen before, and the register function like we've seen before. In the register function, we're going to create an instance of our SQL client, and then we're going to use this special um, uh, function called server.decorate to add our SQL client to the request toolkit. What this is going to do is now every time um, in a such as a route that we define, anywhere that we see a route, we can access the SQL client from within that route by just typing in h.sql. Pretty cool, huh? We can we can create plugins this way where we can decorate our request toolkit with anything and everything that we need to use throughout our, our uh, Node.js application. So next, um, let's create a, um, well, we need to update our plugins index to include that new SQL plugin. So um, underneath auth, let's require in our SQL plugin. And then as part of the regist register, uh, let's include the SQL plugin as a register. Good to go. And now under source routes, let's create uh, a folder to include all of our API routes. Again, you know, uh, creating some structure to our, our Node.js application. 
So under API, let's create a, uh, a file named, you guessed it, index.js. And in here, I'm going to paste in a whole bunch of code that we'll walk through together. Now, I'm putting this, I'm, I'm kind of going back and violating something that I said earlier uh, about structuring a Node.js project. That is, I'm just throwing all of this into one big index file. We could separate these out into separate, um, you know, file, like a file per route, like uh, under API have a, a file named uh, add measurement for current user, uh, get measurement for current user by, by user ID. All these different routes we could we could uh, divide those into separate files and and pull those in. That's great. I mean, if you want to do that, that um, e either it's just a personal preference. And as a project grows, maybe you go and refactor your your project structure to make to whatever makes more sense. It's going to make it easier to, to understand and easier to maintain. So in this um, API routes um, module, we've got a whole bunch of routes defined. Um, the first one that's listed here is the add measurement for current user, and it is a post method. So we're posting data uh, to this, this API endpoint. The path is slash API slash measurements. And we're going to say if, it, we're going to repeat this pattern um, with, um, with all the routes in here, but if the request is not authenticated, then we're going to return a boom dot unauthorized error message. Now the reason we're doing this instead of um, using the the built-in auth, you know, like we defined when we registered our auth, we set the default session, uh, the default authentication strategy to session. Um, when we're calling an API endpoint, say from and, and later on, we're going to be using Vue.js and uh, probably Axios, if I remember correctly, uh, to make API calls. Um, we could use the fetch, the built-in fetch object as, as well. Um, we don't want to, when we make a, a request to an API endpoint, for that to somehow be redirected. It's not going to be, it's not going to be visible to the, to the person who is using the application, it's, it's kind of an internal thing. And a, an API d generally doesn't return redirects anyway. It returns specific error codes that, that the application or the JavaScript can then uh, respond to and, and handle accordingly. So one way we can do this is just by saying every one of these endpoints is um, has an auth uh, of try. The auth mode is try. So we're going to attempt to s check to see if the user is authenticated, but we're not going to we're not going to enforce authentication, meaning we're not going to redirect them if they're not authenticated. But if they're not authenticated, then we send that that unauthorized error message. So that short circuits the route. Anytime a person is not authenticated and they try to access one of these API endpoints, they're going to get that that, uh, that unauthorized error message. So we know that the person is authenticated. We're going to get their user ID from their authentication credentials. That's part of their authentication uh, profile uh, that's provided by Okta, um, there's there's basic basic profile information, and then we're going to extract the measure date and weight 
from the payload that's being sent to this API endpoint. And we're going to uh, call insert into our measurements table with user ID, measure date, weight with these values, user ID, measure date, weight. And when we're done, we're going to return these values from that insert statement. Okay. Now you're probably looking at this and thinking, wait a second. Um, if, if you know anything about doing stuff with databases, you know that using templated strings and just putting stuff into strings is a bad idea. Trademark bad idea. Um, because of SQL injection in tax. Uh, someone could specify as a parameter or, or you know, a field, you know, you've, you've probably seen the, the classic, you know, little Bobby Tables cartoon, right? Uh, they could create an injection attack that actually short circuits the, the SQL statement uh, and causes, you know, bad things to happen. Okay. But, this SQL client that uh, this Postgres client that we're using has SQL injection, um, uh, or rather, I should say, has parameterized SQL queries built in. It's going to parse this templated string that we're passing, and it automatically automatically creates for us. Um, Parameter, a parameterized query, uh, and it's going to pass these values as named parameters. All that to say, that's going to handle um, per, or prevent SQL injection attacks, uh, even though it looks like this code may be vulnerable to SQL injection attacks. Less boilerplate, less less code that we have to generate. Uh, this client is pretty cool, in my opinion. Okay, so that is the API measurements post. There's a, also as part of the options, we're using a, a validate property that uses the Joy plugin uh, for, for validation. So the payload is expected to be an object that has a measure date property and a weight property. The measure date is, is a date data type and the weight is a number data type. If this API endpoint um, is called with something else, like it doesn't have a measure date and a weight, then it's going to return an error message not going to run any of this code because the data that it's receiving is invalid. So Joy is a really awesome and super flexible um, uh, input validation tool um, that we can, it, it's very expressive. You can do a lot with it. And this is just, you know, one little tiny scratch on the surface of what you can do with the Happy Joy plugin. All right, so our other endpoints we have, we have a API measurements get uh, endpoint. So it's the same route or same path, but it's a get method instead of a post method. And it's going to return all of the uh, measurements for the current user. So it's going to first check it, is the user authorized it's going to get the user ID of the current user. It's going to select all the measurements where user ID is equal to user ID and order those by measure date. So ascending order. Super cool and awesome. It's going, you know, this, um, again, this Postgres client, we can say um, measurements is equal to await.h dot SQL and measurements is, you know, our, our array of, of rows from the database. Super cool. We have a delete method 
um, that is the uh, the path is API measurements slash ID. ID is that um, uh, parameter uh, query per, not query parameter, but it's it's part of the path. And um, so it's going to pull the ID from request.params instead of request.payload. Payload is is like the data that's posted on a post or put command. And params is the how you get to um, query query string print or path type objects. And um, if we're gonna we're gonna run that delete and if delete succeeded we'll return a 204 which is like a um, no data you know there's no data that required to return from that, that API endpoint or if uh, there was no rows affected then we return the not found and again we're validating that the the ID is a number and it's an integer. Get measurement by, excuse me, by current ID, current user by ID. So we're using a parameterized path, a parameterized query where we're selecting a specific measure by user ID and ID. So all these all these queries are taking into an account the authenticated user's user ID. So in essence, what we've what you're creating here is a multi-tenant application. Um, so that anyone who uses this application, they're only going to see their data. They're not going to accidentally see anybody else's data because every query uh, that's done against this database either inserts, updates, deletes, um, you know, selects, all the basic CRUD operations take into consideration the user ID that is part of the uh, login for the, that uh, current user. We have an update, which is a put method that takes in an ID. It also has uh, a payload of measure date and weight. So if for some reason we wanted to uh, update a particular measurement to change the weight or the date for that measurement, we can do that through the API. And then finally, um, so those are all the CRUD operations for the API. And finally, we export an array of all those routes. Well, well let's um, <clears throat> take another moment for a, a warm beverage. Oh, we're getting there. Let's create a view for adding our measurements and tracking our progress. So under source templates, Let's create a new file called add.ejs. And this is going to be a whole bunch of stuff. Um, this tutorial is really focused on the Node.js aspects, uh, the authentication, the server side things, uh, using Postgres. So it's a little bit out of scope of the tutorial to uh, go into really in depth into what um, is being done here with Vue.js. But uh, I'll walk through some of these things and you can see, uh, hopefully understand how Vue is being used to uh, in on the front end for doing these, these operations. So, um, our app is what Vue uses to register um, a, a Vue application. So we have an ID, uh, we have this div tag that's, that holds 
everything that's on this page. Um, our title is is an ad measurement. We have a form, and we're using app submit dot prevent um, is a view thing to prevent that form from from being redirected. We instead we want to call this function that we're defining in the JavaScript code to uh, make an API call to add a weight measurement. And um, so we have a date field that, had, that is an input of type date. And we, are, we have some placeholder text. And we're using, um, we're binding this date field to our model of <clears throat> model property of measure date, and we're trimming that value at the same time. Um, same goes for weight. We're, we're specifying a uh, that our input is a number, and we can throw some some interesting properties on this input to say uh, it can inc incrementally be uh, values of 0.1. Minimum is zero, max is two thousand, and uh, we're we're setting our B model. We're binding this field to the current weight value, and then we have a submit button and a cancel button, and then for uh, for purposes of showing messages and error messages, we have. A couple of uh, uh, placeholders for that information. So in our script, JavaScript for this front end, uh, we're, we're creating a new view application, passing in that app as our that we defined up here, the ID of our our div tag, and in the data for the view application, we're returning basically a def this is this is the default. So when the when the form comes up, the date is going to be automatically populated with today's date. Uh, the weight is empty, or in this case undefined, so that it's got an empty measurement. Uh, disabled is false. We we're going to use that disabled to toggle the form disabled and enabled when we're actually making calls to the API. And then we have our add weight method, which is an async function. We're going to dis, you know, set the, our data disabled to true, which is going to trigger that form being disabled while this add weight is being called. And um, we're using the, okay, I thought we might be using Axios, but instead we're using the built-in fetch to make a post to API measurements and uh, we're sending application JSON data and we're going to stringify our measure date and weight from our data. And if the response is 200, then we're going to reset the form and show the message that our weight measurement has been added and um, after a couple of seconds, we're going to clear that that uh, confirmation message. And but if there's an error, then we want to get the response JSON, show that JSON error message uh, in the uh, error placeholder, and then finally re-enable the form. And then we also have a format date function that's going to uh, give us a nicely formatted date instead of the, uh, the JavaScript default date. Good deal. And now let's create a, a new template called list.ejs that's going to list all of our measurements and give us that, that pretty chart. Copy and paste in a whole bunch of code here and uh, walk through some of this. Um, I think, yeah. 
So I want to hot, give us more, some more real estate to look at this code. I should have done that earlier. Um, that is command B or control B. I guess if you're on windows, we'll show and hide the, uh, the project, um, folders and files. So in this, in here, we're, we're pulling in the uh, chart uh, view plugin and uh, uh, the the chart dependencies for to, for showing our our pretty chart. Again, we have a div tag with ID equals app for Vue.js um, title. We have a, a placeholder here for any kind of error messages that might come up, and then we have a uh, a conditional div tag. If we're currently fetching, then we'll show this uh, HTML element getting your measurements. Or if um, we have data, then we'll show everything else. So we have our, our line chart, and the data for our line chart is defined as this chart data function. We have a table, and this table has uh, three columns, date, weight, and then a column for uh, some actions, some buttons. We're going to iterate over, over the measurements that are returned back from our API. And for every measurement, we're going to uh, create a new row that is that includes the measure date, the weight, and a delete button. If we, for whatever reason, we want to delete that measurement, we can uh, we can click that button, and it's going to call remove, passing in that um, that current object. If there's no data to display, then it's going to show this message: no measurements to display. Now we have our script. We can uh, we register the the chart plugin that we're using. And then we create our view app. Again, uh, specifying that the element that we're, we're basing our view app application on is the app element. We have some computed properties that we're using throughout. Uh, that no data function is that computed property is equal to whether or not there are any measurements. The has data is also, are there any measurements? Uh, in our measurement set. And then we have our chart data function, which uh, basically takes the uh, the data that we're, we're getting back from the API and just restructures it. It, uh, it reformats it to be in the, the data structure that the chart expects. Uh, and we have a chart minimum um, computed property that is based on um, what is the the largest weight measurement, and we're adding some some padding around that. And in order to get this is to uh, set the scale of the current chart so that the chart you know looks pretty relative to the the minimum maximum values that are represented by all the data that's that's in that chart. Uh, we have a in the mount. Let's see. So our data function. This is like the initial data set. We're returning an empty array of of measurements. Fetching is equal to false. Error. There's no error message. So this is just def, you know populating the default values for the form. In, in the mounted event or the mounted function of the view application. So this is like, this is fired one time when the view application finishes uh, initializing. Um, so in the mounted event, we're going to fetch all of our measurements from the API. And that method is defined as a method it's an async function. It's going to, uh, you know, first um, 
initialize our, all of our data again. Um, it's going to fetch that API measurements using the get parameter. Um, up here, it's it's setting fetching equal to true. That, that way, it's, it displays the error, the, the message that uh, currently fetching data. And then we're, after we're done, we set fetching to false so that it hides that message again. And then if the response is 200, which is OK, then we're going to get all the JSON data. And we're just going to map that JSON data and do some manipulation on it to clean up the dates and return uh, the ID and the measured date is, is uh, the, the current viewer's uh, locale for that date string and the current weight. And then we have a remove function that is first going to pop up a confirmation. Are you sure you want to delete this measurement? And if so, then call that fetch API to measurements and so forth. That is all. Let's see. <clears throat> the last step is we need to update our routes uh, for these new views. So let's create an, uh, let's go to the source routes folder. Let's close these other files. And in the routes folder, let's create a new file named measurements. We have a uh, add route and a list route. And really, we're just rendering our templates, specifying the title of those pages. Nothing. Nothing fantastic here, just uh, rendering those views. In the uh, source routes index, we need to add uh, our measurements. So, um, oh, you know what? Something I missed earlier. We didn't add our API. We need to do that here too as well. API measurements. And all we need to do is to add these to the array that's passed back. So API measurements. Now for the moment of truth. Our server's been running this whole time and it's detected every change that I've made <laughs> every time I've made them so it's restarted so it's ready to go. Our server's ready. Good, good news is there's not any errors. Um, that, that's reassuring. Let's um, let's go to the browser and let's open up um, the incognito browser. Go to eighty eighty. Everything's good so far. Let's log in. Good. Still don't see, uh, you know, the menus are still a little bit messed up uh, in the responsive mode. But we can still use these uh, links down here. We can go to add or view. Let's click on view first and we get what we expect. It says uh, no measurements to display. So that's also available under this progress. Let's click on add measurement and it defaults to today's date. And let's say 220.5. I wish I weighed 220.5. Uh, 
I'm being optimistic. So click submit. We see our error message, or not error message, we saw a message saying that a measurement had been added and then it went away after a couple of seconds. Uh, let's go ahead and add another measurement. Let's, um, let's add one for yesterday. And let's say it's 221.5. We lost a, lost a pound in a day. That would be cool. Um, and let's back up even further to May, let's say, May 25th. And it's 223.2. Now if we go to our progress, we see a nice trending downward line that we are on track for losing weight and we have our individual measurements listed here in the chart and if we want to we can say I don't I don't like that old one let's just delete it okay boom now we only have two measurements wow that's a lot lot of stuff in there but we made it all the way to the end some of you are gluttons for, for punishment because it has been over two hours <laughs> hi toe frog love your handle you got a question for me If you do have a question, please post it in the chat. Anyone that's still in the uh, on the line, I'll answer some questions if if we have any for a few minutes. Um, trying to think if there's a, if there's anything else I should cover as part of this session. One thing I'll I'll give you while you're here if you're interested in OAuth and OpenID Connect um, or security creating secure applications um, there's a lot of confusing jargon and terminology and conflicting information out there as to what OAuth and OpenID C OpenID Connect are OIDC and uh, I've created a video that is that I call the Illustrated Guide to Open Off OAuth and OpenID Connect. I'm going to paste that link in the uh, in the URL. There's a it's both a blog post and a YouTube video. The YouTube video is included at the top of that blog post. But if you're interested in seeing that, it's about a I want to say it's 16 minutes long, uh, illustrated introduction to OAuth and OpenID Connect. I hope that will serve a good foundation. It has it's, it's not specific to Okta. OAuth and OpenID Connect are uh, standard protocols um, on for the internet for how to handle uh, delegating access to applications uh, using a a trusted login provider like Gmail or Google or Facebook or LinkedIn or your own custom OAuth uh, provider. So I hope that guide would be uh, useful to you. A lot of people seem to <coughs> have found it useful. Um, that's it for this stream. I hope you have found this uh, this entertaining, if not maybe a little bit um, interesting, and uh, maybe you learned something along the way. Maybe maybe you learned that uh, Happy JS is worth checking out, and or maybe that the new Postgres client is pretty cool, and you might want to use that in your your next Node.js project, whether you use Happy JS or not. Um, All right, folks. Well, if until next time, 
Uh, and as always, with anything that I do, I want to uh, encourage you that you don't need permission to be awesome. I hope you take the things that you've learned here and you get out there and you do some amazing things, things that I would have never even dreamed or thought of. I love hearing stories of, of how things that I've shared have, uh, you know, planted seeds or planted ideas to go and do amazing things. So if you have any those stories in the future that you want to share with me, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Um, I hope you have are having a good day. I hope you have a better week. I hope you are doing well, and I'll see you next time on the streams.